workshop uh, lecture series. Uh, today, my charge is to talk about uh, invasives and non-native invasives that are um, found here in Connecticut. And um, I'm gonna do my talking through the slides. If you're at my last lecture, there's a few slides at the beginning that are gonna be similar, uh, just to talk about a little bit about the overview of habitat in Connecticut, and then I'll get into the invasives. And what I'd like to do for you is lay out uh, how we do applied science management. We take information, we apply it to the land. So we take scientific information that has been found um, and we then apply it to the land. And habitat management is all about applied science. Well, um, two things are going to uh, reduce the biological diversity of our state here in Connecticut and also the planet really. It's habitat loss, fragmentation, and then the second greatest threat is invasive non-native species. Today, we're gonna to talk about um, uh, non-native plants and how, they, uh, how we can manage them to influence a, uh, uh, creating better habitats. And I'm gonna draw upon my uh, work experience as a state wildlife biologist. And I'm also gonna uh, uh, talk about things that I have managed uh, on my own land that my, my family and I are, are um, bi biologically uh, improving and restoring a habitat in Sprague, Connecticut. So the future of Connecticut's landscape is gonna depend on the actions that we take. 70% of Connecticut's landscape is owned private by the private sector. Uh, DEP, the state owns some of that of that land. Uh, the, the rest of it, that 25%, that the 30% that, that's not owned by the private sector. Some of it's owned by state, federal, municipalities. Very little is owned by the Fed, federal government. We have some Army Corps property. We have a few uh, wildlife uh, refuges, Stuart McKinney Refuge and a, a couple other ones. But uh, by and large, most of the land in Connecticut is privately owned. So the actions of you know, how we manage that land uh, is really in the private sector's hand, hands mostly. The flora of Connecticut um, uh, is made up of about 2,800 plants. If you, you know, I, I got this figure from Dr. Merhoff at UConn. Um, it's uh, part of uh, the herbarium uh, information. Also, of the 2,800 native, uh, the 28 total plants, 2,800 total plants, 1,800 are native. How do we know that? And I round these down. You could, um, you can get. Um, the, it's like 800, 1,853, but I'm going to round it to 1,800 so that you know, so that you can kind of keep in your mind of the 2,800 plants uh, that were, were, uh, make our landscape, make part of our landscape, 1,800 are uh, native. And then about 1,000 of the 2,800 were brought over by Europeans after the Mayflower uh, landed in uh, Plymouth, forage plants that they fed their animals that they brought over, that's where it started. Then uh, people brought over plants for, for the nursery industry, brought over just favorite herbs and favorite uh, plants that, that from their homeland. So all of our friends, relatives and ancestors since the colonial settlement have brought in another thousand. Now the difference between the thousand and the 1800, the 1800 Picture the 1800 native plants. When the glaciers receded 10,000 years ago, those were the native plants that were colonizing this place. And they, these are the uh, plants that plants and animals have uh, co-evolved over uh, you know, uh, thousands of years. The plants that were brought over by, the, by our uh, ancestors from Asia, from Europe, from all across the, the world, um, they, they did not co-evolve with our local wildlife. They co-evolved with whatever, whatever animals and organisms were in those continents that they came from. Now, how do we know the 1800 what plants? Well, there's been historical notes from botanists that, that tell us what was here, but also they could take core samples. Uh, lakes will flip in the, in the fall. It's called flipping where they it settles to the bottom. Any pollen set, all the pollen you could look at the uh, pollen, you could take cores and go way down into the sediment. You could look at years and years and years of pollen data to see 
what was around uh, back in the day. So 1,800 plants uh, approximately. 97 of those thousand that were brought in from our relatives, ancestors, and friends from across the world, these are on the invasive, the invasive species list. It's a list that's maintained by the state of Connecticut. It was originally started by the Connecticut Invasive Plant Working Group. It was an ad hoc committee of, of professionals that came up with this list. And now there's a formal uh, council that's appointed by the governor and the legislature. And they determined using a set of criteria, which plants of these thousand non-natives are bad actors that will spread through the landscape. And they, they look at their criteria and whether, whether, whether to list them or not. And then there's another step in actually banning them. They could actually uh, ban them through legislative process and um, uh, so that the plants can't be sold or moved around. But we, in habitat management, we use this list to, to pretty much, if, that, if it f it's found on that 97, or if it's one of those 97 invasives, we don't use them in any of our plantings. There's actually a state, uh, there's a, a policy between DOT and DEP to not use any of these 97 uh, invasive plants in any of our projects that are funded through the um, state or, or uh, state projects. So, um, so it carries a lot of weight. And on and I um, on state lands, especially, um, and we're, I'm going to give you a subset of these 97 that we actually have prioritized and started managing them. I'll give you the, some actual examples of how we did it. So what are invasive plants? Well, they were plants that were imported to the US during and after European settlement. They start spreading around. In other words, they're planted, birds may spread them, wind, natural processes of that plant. Uh, because there's not a lot of predation or herbivory on that plant from its, because it, it came from another continent, a lot of times it has an advantage uh, over other native plants and they spread around and they become very uh, common. Um, an example of, a, of an invasive, something like Japanese barberry, or, you know, we're, we're going to go over some, but uh, winged euonymus, Japanese barberry, uh, purple loose strife. What happens is they start displacing the plants. So if you have a 10 acre area, say a 10 acre field, and 50% of it's invasives, wherever those plants are displacing what would normally grow there. So, uh, and the same thing with a forest or a wetland. So the, they're taking the place of a native plant that evolved in that soil and in that place and, and uh, takes over and degrades. It ends up degrading the habitat, reducing the habitat quality. So what I'd like to do for you is give you an example. This is a um, aerial photo of Sessions Woods in Burlington. And I uh, wrote the 10 year plan for this property, 764 acres. Um, the, um, there's about 13 invasives that we identified on the property. Uh, there was a, there's a uh, inventory of the property being, that was done. There's uh, 21 forest stands on the property. There's some fields, wetlands. And um, we went out there and we identified where the invasives were located on the property. And um, what I did for each invasive, I wrote out a little um, plan on what we were gonna do to manage them and try to reduce their impact on the property. These little red dots, I call them little cancers on the landscape. That's where um, they, they're, they're little tumors there. They're, they're, they're sitting there and we don't want them to spread any further out. So we don't want it to become dominant on the property. Um, an important uh, study that um, illustrates the importance of invasive areas versus having native areas versus invasives. University of T uh, Delaware, this uh, gentleman, uh, Doug Talamy, is an, an entomologist. He and his uh, colleagues uh, reported on a study and it was really cool. I wanna share it with you. Just summarizing it very, you know, kind of uh, quickly. They, they compared four invaded areas and four native sites. And they looked at the caterpillar biomass and the caterpillar use of these areas. And because caterpillars are sort of the engine that feeds the, uh, you know, the, 
that feeds our birds and feeds the, a lot of our wildlife. The plants feed the caterpillars and wildlife feed on the caterpillars. So they looked at the insect life, the caterpillar. And it's real interesting. They found that in the invaded sites, there were 16 times fewer caterpillar species. Uh, because the biological diversity of the plants was less, and there were more invasives, obviously that, that proves it there that there's less species of caterpillars. And there's actually even a fewer uh, biomass, uh, um, you know, in the, and there were a lot less than the native sites. Um, so um, that, that it, uh, their study showed that um, these invaded areas have less productivity for caterpillars. Um, and also, I just wanted to share with you why there was a little study done in Rhode Island on why berries, native berries on native shrubs are more important for birds. They found that there were, there were uh, a lot better uh, at uh, the quality of the fuel source that the native plants provided the uh, birds. There, these, uh, these are native shrubs and uh, one's a vine. It shows that they had a uh, higher a good fat content, which birds need to fuel up for their migrations and, and also to put fat on to stay here in Connecticut for the winter, the ones that don't migrate. So um, just wanted to share those two scientific studies that were in the literature that just shows the benefit. You could find many more of, of these um, correlations between native plants being more valuable for wildlife. There's a book that Doug Tallamy wrote called Bringing Nature Home. I encourage you to read it. Um, it, it he puts more information. He's an entomologist and he, he's been um, reporting on the importance of native plants for native insects. Okay, so what I'd like to do for you, uh, I'm gonna give you an example in, of these four invasive species, okay? And I'm gonna uh, share with you how we went about managing them, okay? Uh, and um, of course, there's 97 invasive species. I can't cover them all in our in our lecture, but I will do my best to share with you some examples of how we manage them on state land. Well, before I do that, I want to make sure that um, this term carrying capacity is covered. Carrying capacity is the average number of animals that live in a given area from season to season. Okay, the average number of animals that live in an area from season to season. These little boxes, um, we have limited control over those, those uh, elements in those boxes. Um, indirectly, we, we do influence them, but the, the thing we have the most influence is habitat. The only way that you could increase the average number of animals that live from season to season in an area is by improving the quality and quantity of habitat. It's really the, the sustainable way. Um, if I had a five gallon bucket, I could only put five gallons in it. How could I get six gallons in a five gallon bucket? I have to make the pail bigger. Um, a lady once asked me if she could uh, stock some cardinals in her yard because you want to see more yards. I kind of chuckled about that because it's like there's the cardinals in your backyard are what is usually found because of the food cover shelter and space that's there. And um, that's why they're there. If you stockpile more in the backyard, they're probably not going to survive because you can't stockpile animals. They have to have food, water, shelter, cover, and space. So the quality and the quantity of the habitat, if, if a piece of property is inundated with invasives, and, uh, they're usurping some of the habitat. So if you remove some invasives and allow the natives to take over those places, you could increase the quality of that habitat. And therefore, I'll give you an example. If a field is 100% purple loosestrife, and, um, and there's no milkweed out there for the milkweed, for the monarch butterfly to lay its egg on, the, the butterfly can still eat the nectar from the plants, but it's not gonna have anything to lay its eggs on. So if you cut out the, 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 uh, the uh, purple loosestrife and add in Sclapius incarnata, which is swamp milkweed, then the monarch can lay its eggs on, on, the, on the milkweed and now it's, it's having its life cycle. You can increase the average number of monarch butterflies on that piece of property by improving the quality and the quantity of, the, of its habitat. That's just a small example. If you wanted to, um, you know, so managing invasives can improve the quality of a habitat. If you wanted to see more 
hummingbirds in your neighborhood, you you know you can put up a feeder, but that's not going to prove much because it's just going to find some nectar. Put up tubular flowers, right? Native tubular flowers. You could increase the carrying capacity of your neighborhood of of hummingbirds by putting putting in the quality native uh, tubular flowers. So you restore the habitat. Now, it, it's important when you get into uh, in, invasive plant management, this graph, it's a, it's a S-shaped curve. The left axis here, this is the abundance, and then you have time, time and abundance. If you um, identify an invasive species on a, whatever parcel of land you're managing early, when they're few in numbers, when there's few of it, few of that invasive, you could prevent it from becoming a, you know, this is a J-shaped curve, and then it, it turns into an S-shape here. But um, a lot of times people react when the, when the, uh, the there's a lot of plants in there. Wow, that field is filled with purple loosestrife, or, you know, it's, uh, the forest is filled with Japanese barberry. Um, if, you, uh, if you get it down here, when it's early stages, you could prevent the spread. So, um, uh, you know, early, early detection, rapid response, is preferred to, you know, later response when you need to have a lot of resources to knock it out and it becomes more difficult. So um, this is, um, you know, um, I, I, I think about this a lot when I'm thinking about invasive species. When I'm out in the field, I, I try to, if I see um, an invasive plant, like one autumn, one autumn olive sitting in the side of the field can produce 60 pounds of fruit. If I cut that thing down and not let it produce those 60 pounds of fruit, the birds aren't going to spread it out in the rest of the fields. So there's um, wisdom in getting something early, you know, knocking it out early. Um, over here at Sessions Woods, this is an aerial photo. Um, on, the, on the west side of our property, this, the East Chippensville Road, I, we noticed that there was winged euonymus coming in. And um, there were, you know, anywhere from six inches to three or four feet tall. And we noticed that the seed source was across the street in a subdivision. Uh, there was a big, big planting of, of winged euonymus and the birds are eating it and then, you know, um, roosting on our side and then the droppings end up germinating. So we, uh, we find that on the entire property, that's where we find most of our winged euonymuses are in that part of our, uh, part of our uh, property. So we started in, you know, we started managing them. Um, you know, this is what purple, uh, what uh, wind euonymus looks like um, in the understory. Very shade tolerant plant. Has a berry that the birds eat. Um, it's got these cork, cork-like um, structures on the uh, stems. It's, uh, it's corky, and um, birds will eat these. And then, um, you know, as they fly off, they they'll uh, as they're digesting them, they'll drop them into the forest. Um, you'll find a lot of this at Sessions Woods during our management strategies. We we will um, we will uh, uh, we'll pull them out mechanically, whether by hand or by um, we'll, we'll we'll move we'll pull them out by hand or we'll pull them out using um, you know uh, a pickaxe or some there's a there's a little hand tool uh, called a weed puller. I don't have a picture of it. I, I, I didn't have a handy shot of that, but um, uh, hanging it up upside down will dry out the roots and cause it to, uh, to dry out and die so that it doesn't continue to propagate. Um, and uh, we also will, in bigger patches, in this case, because the patch is small, we, we can uh, manage it by mechanical. We'll also cut the stem uh, and then we'll paint Triclopyr, which is brush be gone. I'll show you a few slides later on that technique, but we'll, we'll, we'll paint, strategically paint, paint an herbicide onto the stem so that it kills the roots. Um, and we'll talk about the, 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 the weighing the option of using all these techniques, but uh, uh, whenever we can, we try to use mechanical. Um, I'd like to share with you um, some management strategies that I've applied on on our own land in Sprague, we, my wife and I and my kids, um, we had, uh, we're ecologically restoring a 40 acre property there. 
and I'll share some experiences there. Um, uh, we we are, are really active as a whole family managing our habitat. So I kind of practice what I preach, not only what I what we do on in my state work, but also in my private uh, work. Since 2004, we all have uh, had our share of managing invasives, planting natives, and I'll, and I'll share some of that experience as well. I'd like to dedicate this talk to my son, Neil, who's passed away this past May. We, and we really miss him. He was a really um, hardworking uh, young man, helped us uh, manage our land. <clears throat> okay, so um, these um, dots on the landscape is where uh, the, the, the property boundary, you can see where it is. And I did the same thing that I did at Sessions Woods by putting in the dots where the invasives are. And I'll share with you um, an experience with uh, wing. Uh, uh, I like to do. I like to share with you the Oriental bittersweet example here because we we um, you have to pick your battles when you're managing invasives. An Oriental bittersweet is one that will go up a tree and literally create hundreds and hundreds of pounds of weight on the tree. And sometimes I'll, I'll share with you some examples. These are all vines of bittersweet and uh, oriental bittersweet was brought in uh, to the United States for gardening purposes. People make reeds out of them. And um, anyway, um, you can see where we started cutting them. And, we, and what we do is we will paint the stems with the same thing with a brush begun trichopier to kill the root. And uh, this, you could see all these vines during ice or snow time, you know, really weighted ice or cold winters. You, we have trees uproot themselves, literally just fall over from the weight of this plant. Um, the berries are readily eaten by, by wildlife um, and uh, spread around. Um, this is what they'll do to a tree if, they're, if they get the opportunity to wrap around uh, the stems and distort them and sometimes outright kill them. You'd see the distortion on this uh, black cherry. Um, what we'll do is, you know, we'll take and cut. This one was a pretty large one. This, I, I, you know, I noticed that when I count the rings, I've never counted one older than in the late 30s. You know, I've never counted one over that age, but it's kind of challenging. They got real small uh, rings for growth rings. But um, um, this is, uh, you know, you could take a bow saw. And sometimes I've taken a, a chainsaw, depending on how big they are. But usually a hand bow saw is, is enough to, to cut it. And um, we'll judiciously paint or spread this uh, triclopyr, which is brush begun on the stem. And a lot of people um, have questions about using herbicides. And as a practitioner of habitat management, I, I have to um, use all my tools. You have to have different tools, right? Uh, in the case of using herbicides, I'll give you an example. When we first started managing our land, we just would cut vines in the middle of winter. We didn't care when we cut them because we just wanted to cut them down. And uh, what we found is if you cut a stem in the middle of winter, one of these bittersweet vines, it sends a signal to the roots. And next spring, you'll get thousands of runners coming up from the ground, wherever the root system was. By doing it this way in the middle of the summer, by cutting it and then painting it, this uh, truck triclopyr, this brush began will suck into the roots and then you won't get that root sprouting. So it prevents future invasions. Um, so whenever I can, we, we use this and we, we, you know, we, you notice there's gloves and we use, we use it just judicially. Now, this is the kind of herbicide you could buy over the counter, but used strategically, it's, it's beneficial in habitat management. If you don't use the triclopyr, this is what happens. You get, see these sprouts, it'll shoot these runners up from the cut stem. So you kind of work, you kind of go back two years later and you're like, wow, there's, look at all these vines, where'd they come from? Well, if you don't treat the stem, this will happen. So we have to, um, you know, make sure we treat the stem. Now you can cut these again with a lopper or pruner and then treat those stems. Now you could see your work, the, all your uh, fruits of our labor, you see all these dead, vines in the trees here. Um, there have been times when bittersweet has literally covered 50 to 80, 90% of the trees. So by cutting those, 
those bittersweet vines, you can actually um, bring the tree back to life. Uh, and, uh, and that's happened um, with our projects. Um, you see your results and these will end up uh, decomposing and falling off the tree. Um, but these are intertwined, you know, really, you couldn't just pull them out. They're very challenging to uh, take off, but eventually they'll fall out. Um, another uh, tree that I'd like, another invasive that I'd like to share an example over about is um, Tree of Heaven. And uh, this plant is, um, was introduced um, for the silkworm industry into the United States. It was brought in. Um, and uh, this scene right here, this is uh, Housatonic River WMA in Kent. And I manage that, that area. It's uh, right along the Housatonic River. And uh, there's the, the challenge with this plant is that it was introduced in the, you know, the 1700s by a Philadelphia gardener. Um, it displaces by not only growing there, but it has an allelopathic, uh, allelopathic it has an effect, a negative effect on other uh, plants around it. Uh, so it spreads and it can produce a chemical. It was identified that it has a phytotoxic compound in it. In the Journal of Chemical Ecology, they found that the roots and the leaves can actually suppress the growth of other plants around it. So it has a, a net negative effect on the area that it's growing. So there's female and male clones. So there's the plant has a female, uh, which will produce the seeds and then it has males. So the, the female clones produce a lot of seed. And that's what you see here are the seed heads on the plant. <clears throat> the seeds are very Thank prolific. You. Um, you know, there's, you can get up to 35, uh, 350,000 seeds per mature tree. That's a lot of seed being pumped out into the environment. The uh, Housatonic River is right nearby here. You know, the wind would blow the seeds into the river and who knows how many were going downstream as well. So um, whenever I uh, look at our state land areas or even uh, my own land, when Tree of Heaven comes in, you want to knock it out, especially if it's going to be the seed producers, the female clones. They get pretty tall, up to 80 to 100 feet. So they're, they're pretty big trees. <clears throat> now, at Simsbury Wildlife Management Area, this is an aerial photo. <clears throat> that red area is also um, showing <clears throat> where they're growing. <clears throat> Now, this is, um, this is the, the, the picture of the patch. And um, I want to do a little identification for you, tree ID, because they do look like another plant. The, the, the uh, tree of heaven is a compound leaf in it. It sort of, a lot of people think it's sumac. And I just want to show you this upper part here. That's the invasive tree of heaven that's growing alongside the sumac. And below it is... Um, the uh, sumac, um, the, uh, the staghorn sumac. And um, if we don't do take management of these tree of heaven, uh, it'll, it'll overtake our native, uh, our native staghorn sumac. <clears throat> the tree of heaven has a smooth stem. Um, and um, the, when you pull the leaf off, the compound leaf has this big smiley face there, the leaf scar. The uh, staghorn sumac has, turns really bright red in the fall, um, has a, a fuzzy or hairy stem. That's why they call it staghorn. It looks like the stag, the, ant, the antlers of a stag during, when, they, when they're growing <laughs> deer. And this also produces a, a berry that, um, the birds eat um, during the um, fall and winter foods and spring, actually migration, both fall migration, spring migration and uh, fall. Um, um, I'll give you an example. Here's a robin feeding on some in the middle of winter underneath the power line. <clears throat> Here's a, um, I drive by this place when I, before pre-COVID 
in Bristol. I drive by to get to work in Burlington and there was a blizzard going on. And here you could see, I finally was able to videotape some robins feeding on the, uh, the um, staghorn sumac berries. I've also seen blueberry, bluebirds. I've seen turkeys. I've seen flickers. Um, a, a wide variety of animals like to feed on. But during the harsh of winters when they're really most valuable. So um, how are we going to save the staghorn sumac from the, uh, from the uh, invading tree of heaven? What we did is uh, we either outright cut them and then painted the stems, just like I showed you with the bittersweet, with the trichopier, or we would take an ax and just make a, get through that outer layer um, of the bark and then infuse it with the trichopier. And um, that will then get sucked into the roots and, um, and knock out the tree. We had some really big diameter One's down at Housatonic River WMA. Um, I wish I had a uh, something to show you, but these were a good 15 to 18 inch, 20 inch diameter uh, trees. And um, you could see we, we would double chainsaw. We would take a chainsaw and ring it and then also fill that with trichopier, or then we would take an ax to it and also double ring it. Um, trees are... Um, Sometimes they're diffuse and they'll have their bark goes further into the uh, tree and you have to really get at that, make sure you get to that inner layer. Others are, will die off a lot more, a lot easier. Tree having relatively um, thin bark, but um, you need to uh, judiciously make sure you, you, know, you get, get that herbicide into the cracks. <clears throat> now here you can see um, a, a shot of that patch that I showed you, the first slide I showed you, now you see they're all standing dead trees. Um, before we uh, did this management, we also had a brontosaurus, uh, a piece of equipment that, and I'll show you a picture. Um, well, I, I don't know if I have a, but we, um, we had a machine go in and take out the smaller ones in front, then the bigger diameter ones that were left standing, we girdled. So we did do some, we did have a machine that had a drum chop mower originally take out smaller ones in front. I, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of it here, but um, I thought I did, but, um, and then we girdled them. And this prevent, now, if you go back to this site, um, we've uh, pretty much, I would say 98% uh, knocked out the tree of heaven on this property. And uh, there's, uh, you know, about 500 acres total in the whole area. And it's, uh, you know, we, we hit the big clones and then we, we hit individual ones that we found. And uh, when you find one, usually you find more because they clone. Um, but a very effective uh, method of management uh, if you want to manage tree of heaven. <clears throat> now on our property at Sprague, I only had one, one clone of it. It was a male clone where number four is. It was in the corner of our field. And we did the same thing. We girdled them. And, uh, and uh, I don't have any, you know, I got it early. It was at the early part of that curve. You know, I didn't let that, let them clone into the field and get bigger and bigger and bigger. We knocked them out by girdling them and, and putting triclopyr in them. And we knocked them out and we weren't, we don't have any on the 40 acre property down there in Sprague because we proactively managed them early. Now, um, another example of early detection it wrap... Peter, there was a question in the chat box. Is it okay to take it now or do you want to take it at the end? Uh, I'd rather wait to the end if you don't mind. That's totally fine. Yeah. Um, invasive, um, invasive. Uh, I, I, uh, the, remember I showed you that curve uh, of the managing early um, is advantageous. So invasive Japanese stilt grass is, um, I, I was driving into the facility. This is Route 69, Sessions Woods, Burlington. Uh, New, it's Milford Street. I look over and I, I said, oh, what is that green patch of grass over there? And I look down and it's this uh, patch of uh, Japanese stilt grass. I'd never seen it at Sessions Woods. And uh, I was lucky to detect it early. Um, it's a really interesting grass. It's an annual, so it's not perennial. It has to seed itself every year. And the blade is real interesting. It's, uh, not, it's not unilateral. 
It's got one side is a little bit larger than the other side. It has this little white vein. Uh, so if you want to detect it, it's very uh, detectable that way by looking at it. Um, it could become a virtual dense mat in the understory if you don't manage it. Um, if you catch it early, you can stop it from spreading. Um, but uh, you, as you can see here, it's spread throughout the understory. Um, uh, as an annual, you could pull it up, you know, mow it down. Let, don't let it go to seed. But uh, um, when it gets in a large, when it gets huge like this, in a big, you know, when it, when it engrosses a large area, it becomes more challenging to manage. So if you start mowing that down, you might mow over some native stuff. But you could see that it really inhibits the growth of a lot of ground cover other than itself. So it's a really bad one. Um, if you get this one early, detect it early, and knock it out, you'll save yourself a lot of headaches later. Um, definitely one that's that's uh, a challenge, uh, especially in Fairfield County and now Litchfield County, and it's moving over, you know, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of towns have it now. Um, we prefer to the native plants, right? Why? Because the native plants were co-evolved with our wildlife. And uh, our native at Sessions Woods, this is an aerial photo of Sessions Woods, and I, these are the kinds of plants that we replaced our, our non-native grasses with. And um, some of you may say, why, well, why is uh, little blue stem and native grasses more important? Well, here's two turkeys. One day I took a video of uh, these turkeys bobbing their heads in a field. And I didn't, really didn't know what they were doing. I thought they were chasing bugs around. And I took the video and then I put it on my computer at home and I'm looking at it and I'm like, what the heck are they doing? And they're stripping the seeds from the little blue stem, taking that fluffy seed and making, um, you know, filling up their crops. They're, they're foraging on it. Um, and uh, neat uh, observation. I've never seen, you know, I've seen turkeys bobbing their heads in the fields, but I've never closely paid attention to what, you know, what are they actually doing? And here they are stripping the seed uh, from the little blue stem. These grasses are bunch grasses and they create a neat habitat. You can see the little nooks and crannies here uh, in between. Uh, what bunch grasses do is they allow other plants to grow in between and they, uh, animals can forage in between there. And um, they don't, uh, they're not a thick mat of rhizominous one type of grass. There's, you know, soil in between. So they're very important. Then big blue stem, I call this turkey foot, big blue stem. And then one of my favorite grasses, the deer tongue grass, um, it turns this variegated color in the fall. And uh, I always keenly observed it to try to see if I could see something feeding on it. And then one winter, I actually uh, did find something feeding on it. I'm watching this junco in this field and I'm closely observing it. it this is a dried up deer tongue grass. And here's the junco climbing up the deer tongue grass. And look, they're going to, um, it's going to go up there. It's going to eat the little seeds that are found at the tips. Little, uh, the little seed heads there, little tiny seeds. You ever walk into a field, a bunch of birds fly out, you say, what the heck are they doing in there? Well, you know, the, this is, uh, shows that importance there. They're feeding on the seeds. Uh, the persistent winter seeds are important for our local wildlife and our migratory wildlife that come in and spend the winter here, like this junco. So, um, Native grasses are more important than the Japanese stiltgrass that would then take over and cause a disruption to the natural ecosystem. Now, we also will plant big fields of native grasses, uh, like what you see here. You'll see, uh, we'll take this uh, planter here, this uh, Truax planter. The native seeds are very fluffy. You, we could plant, put them in this hopper. If you took this native seed and threw it in the air, the wind would blow it away. So you can't put it in a regular like spreader seed or you have to use this Truax planter that agitates them and shoots the seeds down into the little split in the, in the, um, in the ground so that it could touch the earth and then germinate later. And uh, we're doing this. And then one hopper, we put the native seeds. Another hopper, we put in the native wildflowers. And another hopper, we'll put a cover crop. If it's a bare, if it's a bare soil, we want to have a, uh, annual cover crop on it. But um, we're doing this on a lot of our state land areas, as well as on some land trust properties on um, 
you know, uh, private lands as well. People that are interested in uh, creating native grass and native wildflower meadows. Um, winged Ioannis is the next example I'd like to give you uh, as an invasive, uh, I mean, uh, not Winged Ioannis, Autumn Olive. Um, autumn Olive is, was, uh, and I, I wanna point out that it's uh, another instant results plant. 60 pounds of fruit can grow in it and uh, can grow on it. So you say, wow, what a great return on investment. Uh, the only problem is it's very invasive. Um, the, when I first started working for DEEP in 1990, our state nursery was still growing it, believe it or not. And biologists were promoting it. Soil conservationists were promoting it. It's a, it's a nitrogen fixing plant. Nobody knew at the time that it was an invasive plant. You know, it feeds the bluebirds and the turkeys. Well, what were the turkeys and the bluebirds feeding on 10,000 years ago? You know, or five, you know, 4,000 years ago, it's 5,000. You know, they're, they've co-evolved with native wild, wild uh, flora. This was brought in because we thought it was, uh, people thought it was a very valuable habitat plant. Well, it turns out it's very invasive and it, it will kill the plants around it. It will suppress the growth. Like here's two autumn olives and here's a silky dogwood in the middle. You see how it's, it's shrunken down, barely alive. Um, if you don't cut these autumn olives out, this silky dogwood is never gonna get the chance to grow because there's chemical in the, in the growth of these plants it'll suppress this growth of this plant. Um, so it's, 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 in, it's invasive, uh, the autumn olive. So you wanna cut those down and paint the stems. So that's uh, very important to do. Um, when I first started working for DEEP, there was a little plantation at Sessions Woods by my predecessor who planted them as a demonstration, believe it or not. Um, the older I get, um, the more I could talk about stories like this that could go back a few decades. But um, at the time, the biologist in charge of that area didn't, was following the best management practices that was in our, in the manuals for making a better habitat. So it was in a demo site. So when I talked with the gentleman, uh, Steve, he's, he's a great guy, he's, he's a great colleague, fun to work with. He goes, uh, he goes, Pete, you want me to get rid of these, these, these uh, autumn olives? Look how beautiful they're growing. And I can't wait till they get those big, all those nice berries on there. And I said, well, look, they're invasive here. I'll show you, it's in the literature. So, so I showed him the, the, the literature that it was invasive. And then he goes, well, look, how, what are we gonna do to, I'll, I'll take them out, but what are we gonna replace them with? So then I gave him a list of the plants that I thought were more valuable. He and I took a tractor and a chain and we ripped them all out. And we planted in some silky dogwoods and, um, uh, gray dogwood and some viburnums. The state nursery did the same thing. In 1990, they were growing autumn olive. That's where Steve had gotten, the, uh, the biologist had gotten those plants, the little saplings. Um, at that time, Marty Kabansky was the nursery, he ran the nursery there and he also did the same thing. He uh, ended his growing of, of uh, autumn olive in 1991. After that, he planted all natives. And, um, uh, it's a, it, it, we've, we've, we've all evolved in this concept of invasive plant and invasive plant management and, and know that the native plants are more valuable. So um, we learn uh, from history and then we move forward with the new information, right? New technology, new, new uh, scientific information. And the invasives are out and natives are, are biologically, diver create biological diversity when you're trying to restore and enhance habitats. Here's the berries from the uh, silky dogwood that feed our migratory birds and our local turkeys. Now you could also have fun pulling out autumn olives. Like here's my son, Anthony on the ATV. We use it as a tractor, I have a chain on it. And we would, uh, we ripped out literally, I would say hundreds, maybe more. Uh, we tried calculating how many we, but we had, you can see them all piled up on the top of the ATV. Um, we had a lot of fun ripping them out of that, out of, out of that, uh, uh, that uh, field. And now that's a bi very biologically diverse um, uh, grassland habitat with wildflowers. Um, but you can have a lot of fun too, pulling out invasives. Um, here you see, we were cutting out them along the edge and making brush piles for rabbits out of the cut 
stems. And then we paint the we painted the uh, stems. We then planted a variety of uh, lots of different shrubbery along the edges, uh, native plants um, that provide food and cult, food food and shelter and cover. Things like the uh, flowering dogwood that uh, feeds all these birds. So this is a food habits literature. Um, this is all of the plants, all the birds that were recorded to feed on the dogwoods. Um, it's a, there's a book called American uh, Wildlife Food Plants by Martin and Zim. If you um, ever want to have a neat little publication that looks at the historical documentation of birds, animal using plants, birds and other animals feeding on native uh, food sources. Um, a lot of the plants that we've planted, um, oh, um, um, they are, you know, you, 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 know, you can see they're, uh, they, you provide food during the different seasons of the year, from summer, fall, and winter. Now, um, the fields, I want to point out that um, when you mow a field, um, managing, you have to be careful that you don't run over nests. And I just want to share with you an experience. Um, we mow half of the field every year. And um, by mowing it, you can keep it in early succession. You want it herbaceous. Like you see here, there's one little white pine that grew up here. If you mow uh, at least once a year, you'll prevent the, the woody plants from, it, from coming in if you want it to be herbaceous. And a lot of the invasives, it can prevent things like autumn olive and other things from growing in there as well. So you keep it herbaceous. But the timing of the mowing is important. And this was uh, an example of when we, um, I mowed here later than I should have. I, I usually mow half the field. It's a five acre field. I mow half of it every winter. And that year it snowed a lot and the snow got deep. So I, I mowed it um, April 6th, which was later than usual. I like to mow it before March. And uh, unfortunately we had a bad experience. I was, so I was driving the tractor and all of a sudden a woodcock flew by, flew up and over. And I'm like, whoa, I slam on the brakes. And I'm like, whoa, that thing acted like it was nesting and it landed. So sure enough, um, it was, it landed nearby. So I, I um, called, my wife was nearby in the truck. And I called her, I said, can you come over? Uh, you know, I want to see, there might be a woodcock nest in the field here. So she came over and we looked around and I, I knew that the eggs are very cryptic. So I wanted to, you know, we looked very carefully didn't see any broken eggs. And sure enough, we found the nest. Where was it? It was right underneath my bush hog. I, I, what I did is I, I started the tractor. I lifted up the bush hog and moved, moved over. And I found the nest right under the bush hog. To our amazement, that one egg was broken. And um, I don't know if this video will work. Yeah, well, um, here's, here's a video of the woodcock. And here's the nest. This is where we had, we had mowed. So um, my wife and I took the cut brush and we, we cut vegetation and we put it around the nest and uh, the woodcock came over and, and incubated again. What's really, what's really neat about this is I was totally lucky that I didn't run over the nest. I will never nest, I'll never mow that field again after March. Um, but here's the neat thing about um, uh, you know, managing, creating a habitat is uh, I had never seen woodcock nest in fields. I've always seen them nesting in the woods or the edges of the woods in thickets. Here it was nesting in the field. So um, you never know uh, where these birds want to nest, if it's the right density, the right cover. Um, these birds lay one egg a day. So, so this woodcock laid one egg a day, so that took four days. Then they incubate for 28 days. So just imagine how long that thing had at least four days invested on the nest, maybe longer, because I don't know how long she was incubating. But they lay all their eggs, they lay all their eggs, and then after their clutch is laid, then they incubate. They don't lay their eggs and incubate right away because they want their eggs to hatch at once, all at once, the timing of their hatching, because they're precocial. They have advanced, the, 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 when the chicks are born, they, they can run off with the mother and go foraging. 
versus like a robin sits in a nest in a tree, their eggs, if their eggs hatch out different times, it doesn't matter because they bring the food back and they prefer to have different aged birds, you know, even if they're a few days apart. So um, uh, anyway, I want to share that biological information, but these fields are very important for our nesting birds. And um, so managing them is important uh, when you're managing for invasives. You want to also consider the timing of the mowing. So you're not mowing it when there's, uh, you know, nesting going on. This is another example of a field that got hayed and a, a, a hen turkey got run over. Hen female, she had six eggs. Unfortunately, they all got, got trampled. Um, this was um, uh, June 9th, I believe, was that date. But anyway, um, that was an early mow. This was a private land that I, uh, somebody that I know called me when this happened. I went over and looked at it. Um, the the um, this bird, if it hadn't been killed, uh, would have probably re-nested because they, they will re-nest if their eggs are disturbed. Uh, but in this case, it, the hen got, they, they, they hold tight to their nest. The moral story is if you're going to hay, you should hay later on, like after July 15th or later, so that the hatch out. Um, sometimes if you, on some lands, we don't mow at all. Uh, let the fields grow up. In other ones, we take mulch hay, let farmers do it. Um, but uh, uh, you don't want to be mowing too early because of this. Now, um, when you uh, manage invasives, you also want to restore um, habitat to the area, right? So you could let natural, you could cut out the invasives and then you've allowed more room to grow. So native plants will come in. Sometimes you want to restore the place. And we do that by either buying the vegetation at nurseries, uh, buying the seed. Sometimes um, we will collect the seed. Um, in this case, this is uh, um, an example I want to give you. This is a spice bush. And uh, these are the caterpillars that the spice bush butterfly lays the egg on a spice bush. And then these are the instars. It looks like a bird dropping. This is a vestigial tongue. And uh, the next instar looks like a snake with big eyes, but these are vestigial eyes. Um, the, this is a vestigial tongue, but these um, caterpillars will hide in a leaf and then they will um, emerge at night to feed on the plant. And then during the day, it curls the leaf and then hides in here so it doesn't get eaten by predators. But look at this, trying to look like a bird dropping. The, 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 the thousands of years of evolution to survive they look like they try to make themselves look like a bird dropping with a vestigial tongue and they look like a big eyed snake to spook the bird away. Um, it's really interesting evolution here. But the, the point I'm trying to stress here and I'm adding some information just because I know you guys are envirothoners and more information is good. Um, but, you know, just loving nature and loving uh, this information, you know, learning more about wildlife. But the spice bush was in the understory of our land at Sprague. And um, what we did is to re we cleared out 12 acres of barberry in the understory. We not we either mechanically or chemically killed it. And then we wanted to restore it with native plants. So we need a shade tolerant because you have an overstory of trees. So what we did is we collected these berries from the spice bush and we gave it to a contract grower and they grew them out and then we planted them back in. So just want to give you a little bit, a touch of restoration in this lecture that you can restore back with native plants uh, by collecting the seed, having them grow it out. You can also buy native plants. But in this case, I wanted the, that ecotype that from that spot and I was able to collect the seed Me and my family were able to collect the seed and then um, bring it to a contract grower and let them grow it out in potted plants and then we restore them back. So um, when you restore an area, you want to think of all the different seasons of the year, the early spring foods, summer foods, fall foods, persistent winter foods, seasonal cover. You want to think about the grasses and the native wildflowers and decaying trees, dead or decaying trees. You know, you're, you're trying to consider these things when you're restoring a habitat. This is boiled down to the very basics. And um, now, if you want to do some invasive plant management or any type of 
habitat management, whether it's on your school, your own how where you, you know your own backyard, or you get permission from a land trust, or you help out somebody that has land. Um, you want to locate the boundaries and map the boundaries of your of the area, right? Then you want to inventory what you have there, and um, look at the conditions. And you know, even if you only learn three or four invasive species, you could flag them. You know, you could monitor for them and know where they are. Okay. And the limiting factor are invasives are limiting to the area. So, if you find an invasive, whether it's an autumn olive or whether it's a bittersweet vine it's one of the limiting factors for the property. So you can write that in the limiting factor list, flag it. And then you wanna figure out a strategy on how you're gonna manage those uh, limiting factors that invasive. So you create yourself a little timeline. Um, for example, our own land in Sprague, me and my wife and kids, we sat down and we, we figured out, okay, sh let's start getting the autumn olive out because we wanna restore our meadow. And then there's the tree of heaven on the, on the corner there, we wanna knock that out. There's the knotweed in the other corner. So let's get those taken care of so then we can start restoring the field. At Sessions Woods, we have 13 invasives. So I had to figure out which ones are the prioritized, which ones I'm going to go after first, depending on help and money and resources, right? So the, the uh, winged euonymus was easy because there wasn't a lot of it in the western side. We just had to rip most of it out, paint a couple stems, and every year it gets less and less work over there. The Japanese stiltgrass was easy because it was just keep monitoring and watch out. But there are some um, that uh, like the, uh, you know, um, Phragmites, which is in the middle of the swamp. It's wet. You can only, you have to get in a canoe to go out there. You have to have specialized equipment more to do stuff. And we still haven't knocked out all of our Phragmites because it's tough and you have to just navigating through the swamp and just not readily available. So, um, whereas we, we also knocked out 18 acres of locust on the, on Sessions Woods. Uh, that was because we had gotten a grant from the USDA uh, Natural Resource Conservation Service here in Connecticut. So you want to make yourself a simple map. Um, and I'm going to boil it down to a very simple thing here, right? Um, the uh, You want to identify uh, what you have you make, this is the boundary. This rectangular could be square, could be, uh, you know, could be, um, could be square, it could be uh, round, it could be amoeba-like, whatever your boundaries are, right? You want to put that on. But today there's, you have many opportunities to go on sites like GoBotany, uh, iNaturalist, um, iSeq. Uh, uh, there's lots of plant identification aids that you get electronically. And you want to make sure that you, um, you, you know, you plot them out where they are on your land. And then you want to plot out the invasives. If you don't know what a plant is, you, don't, you leave it blank. But you want to make a list of um, what you have. And um, here's where you, you put this on your refrigerator and you, uh, or wherever on your, if you, you know, if you're allowed to go back to school on your bulletin board and you, uh, or, you know, you make a plan. And you say, well, you know, we, can we, um, you know, knock out the uh, winged euonymus in the understory here? Can we, uh, you know, which, which ones do we want to take, take, uh, take a, a stab at first and um, make a plan over, over the course of a few years? Because you're not going to get it done in one year. So make a plan, a simple plan. You know, I, in here I also include nest boxes. I include, um, um, I include um, edges. Um, you know, this edge right here, this where the forest meets the the grass. You could you could make a little plantation of native wildflowers and shrub native shrubs, so that you have a gradual progression of plants into the up to the forest. You don't have an abrupt edge where it's a grass all the way up to a tree. You can have a gradual step up vegetative uh, layering there. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things. And nest boxes, you, nest boxes are six pieces of wood with a hole in it. You could basically uh, put them along the edges of the field so you can get bluebirds or tree swallows or, or house wrens to nest in them. Um, you could also 
um, I always advocate for leaving some dead or dying uh, plants. This is, I'm going to share this little story with you. You know, putting a nest box up is putting six pieces of wood with a hole in it and mimicking nature, basically. This is a gray birch that I planted back in, in uh, young, the young, young folks in the audience. Time flies very quickly. So you see this solar panel, I call it the solar panel, it used to be full of hair. That was when I was younger. Now uh, my age shows itself, right? Um, I planted these darn little uh, gray birches because I like gray birch and they were about the size of my pinky. And I planted them along the edge of my driveway. Why, did, why do I do it? Well, the birds eat the catkins, you know, and I know that they kind of turn this beautiful white color. They're not like paper birch where it peels. They don't peel. The gray birch doesn't peel. But anyway, I dug them out of a field that um, an orchard was expanding and a friend of mine said I could dig them out. So I did. And anyway, I bare root planted them. Then came a winter storm and the, they bent over and they snapped off. So um, instead of cutting them at the bottom, because I know they'll re-sprout, I left a, like a four foot piece and you'll see the top right here. See the top snapped off, but I left it there and I let the bottom grow out. I know the thing's not gonna land on my house or hurt my car or you, know, you don't want a dangerous snag on your property and I'm not telling you to do that, but this is like three and a half inches in diameter. Well, I'm driving out of my driveway, you know, a few years later, and I see chickadee uh, in a hollowing out the a downy, ne a downy woodpecker nest that it had, uh, which I hadn't noticed before, but they raised a neat brood of chickadees in there. So it's very rewarding. So, um, you know, I just want to share that with you because it's not all about putting nest boxes up. It's also recognizing the natural habitats out there. And you could create little micro habitats, no matter where you go, um, you can make a difference. If you remove an invasive, you've made a difference. If you add a, a native, you've made a difference. So there's a lot of good things you could do. Now I'm gonna summarize, always ask yourself, what is the habitat significance? If you're out there making a plan on planting anything, what is the habitat significance of this plant that we're putting in here, okay? Does it provide seasonal food and cover for wildlife? Is it valuable? Does it like wet, dry, moderately wet, dry? You know, you have to think about the soils. Then you have to also think about, does it like sun or shade? Because every plant has evolved under different conditions and they thrive. So you want it, these are, these are very general things I just want you to think about when you're selecting for plants. And um, also never plant invasive. So ask yourself, is this a non-invasive, is this a non-native invasive? So, Observe nature. The best teacher out there is nature. If you go out there with your binoculars, you walk around. Um, I got those photos of the turkey and the junco eating those plants because of opportunity. You know, you're out there, you got a chance. Look, and always observe, keenly observe nature. Nature tells you a lot of neat stuff and it, it unravels a story or a mystery. Um, there's uh, just thousands and thousands of opportunities to learn. Invasive plant management, you're going to see birds eat invasives, but that doesn't mean that they're good. Animals will take advantage of any food source. You have to think of the big picture, the biological diversity being reduced by invasives. Learn to predict the seasonal plant and animal interaction. Um, um, you know, look, go out there, walk, follow a monarch around and watch it land on a, on a, on a milkweed and lay its egg underneath with its I've watched it, spicebush butterfly flies by. In the old days, I didn't really pay attention. I'd see a butterfly fly by, okay, fine, what's going on? Now I follow them around. I'd watch, okay, lands on a spice bush. Sure enough, you look underneath the leaf, there's a little crystal egg under there. Um, you know, just observe and learn to predict. Now when I see turkeys bobbing their heads, I say, hey, what are they eating? You know, they might not be chasing insects around. Um, Here's a neat observation I made out in South Windsor. Now, this is a this is the Connecticut River. I there was a boat launch going in, and I was asked if I could make recommendations of some plantings along the boat launch. So then I was walking around and I said, let me see what's already growing out here. So I, I noticed this, like, what is going on here? I I could almost see like a row of beans planted here. Is it, are these beans? There's two rows of vegetation. And I'm like, that is weird. So I go up to it, I look carefully, what is it? Well, 
the wave action of the water would carry the seeds up and, and bury them just enough. Here's the tidal line right here, or the or that, you know, the the rise and fall of the water. Not tidal up there, but it's you know what I mean, the, the rise and fall of the water. And um, what was it? It was silver maple seeds that were buried by the silt, and then they were sprouting. And that's the next, um, that was the next forest that's going to grow up here, if you keenly observe. And then there's also um, sycamore, uh, sycamore seeds here as well. So inventory your area, make a simple plan. Diversify your plantings whenever you think about a habitat, diversify, right? And don't plant a monoculture of anything. You really want biological diversity. Increase native plants in your environment if you can. Don't plant invasives. Prioritize which of the invasives you want to manage first. Make a little priority list if you become a habitat manager. And make notes of the locations of where they are. Everyone is a habitat manager, whether you mow your, your family's lawn, or whether you plant a flower or a tree or plant a garden, you're managing that area and creating some kind of a habitat. And try to diversify in each of these categories when you, when you think of that land, okay? And I wanna uh, leave you with two other things, this is the end of my lecture and we'll have some questions and answer, but there's this thing called paralysis by analysis. Some of you may um, look at a plot of land and say, you know, we just, it's overwhelming. I don't know what to do. Even if you do one simple project, and that is um, uh, remove one invasive from the school grounds. Um, pick it, pick autumn olive, pick garlic mustard, pick, we didn't talk about garlic mustard, but a bittersweet vine, cut the vines and uh, see if you get permission for the janitor to treat the stems. If not, you, you'll, at least you cut the vines out of the trees. Um, uh, so don't overanalyze, start somewhere, like pick one of those 1800 plants, start planting some milkweeds in, the in your uh, neighborhood, in your, on your land, on the school grounds, on, get permission and um, float in the seeds if you have to, float them in. That's making a difference too, the, the fluffy seeds. But avoid paralysis by analysis, okay? It's not that complicated, you can, you can do it. Um, and then there's this thing, called extinction by instinct. Um, your neighbor has a truck, you guys go to the local nursery, pick up a bunch of green plants and drive them over and start planting them in the ground. Not really looking at the invasive species list or looking at the native list of Connecticut. That, I call that extinction by instinct where you got, you're a little bit too excited and went into it too quickly. The answer is somewhere in between these two. I hope that, um, I have given you a little bit of insight on managing habitats, invasives, um, with these examples. And I hope that, um, you know, it's an applied science approach. And um, so I'm gonna open it up to, uh, to questions and answers. And uh, Chris, are we ready? Yeah, I'm just gonna go back through the chat and I can just, uh, as they came in, I'll ask those okay. and then, once we get through the list uh, of questions in the chat box that are there now, we can certainly take other questions that come in. So let me get to the first one. So the first question that was asked is, how do you handle adjacent landowners with invasive species to properties that you are actively managing? So if somebody is an adjacent property and they have invasives that are coming onto your property. That's a great question. and. Um... So there's 3 million acres in Connecticut, 70% is privately owned. You only can you only have control over what you have control over. Um, sometimes you, you know, you manage your land and then you look over and say, well, there's a whole stash of invasives over there. The key thing is that you've made a difference here on your property. Um, you can go over and talk with your neighbor and see if they're willing to manage. But if they aren't, uh, it still doesn't prevent you from taking action on your land. Because every square foot that you change on your land, you will biologically improve your property. It will be more diverse. So if they're not managing, doesn't mean that you're not going to be successful. Uh, it makes it a little more challenging for you because you're going to have to monitor a little bit more because that the birds have a drop rate, you know, where they 
they fly and they roost and they drop their droppings. So do deer and so do other animals. Um, so there, there, it'll always be a challenge, but um, I think the wisdom in managing, taking action is that every square foot that you manage, literally every square foot, you know, there's 43,000 square feet in an acre. Okay, so every square foot is, is valuable. Uh, once you convert it to a native, you've made a big difference. So think of it that way and don't worry, take care of your plot first and then, and, and you know, communicate with your neighbor and then try to uh, get them to have action on theirs, okay? Great, thank you, Peter. Uh, next question is, where can native grass seed be purchased? So I think this is referring to the seeds that you had planted on some of your property. Yeah, so um, uh, there are more and more uh, sources of, of native seed. Um, we, both myself and when I, in my professional work and my personal work, there's a company called Ernst Seed Company, E-R-N-S-T, out of Pennsylvania. They, we get a lot of our seed sources from them. They try to um, get eco-regional, locally regional stuff. They're getting better and better at supplying uh, seed that is more local. Um, the, the seed that I, there, some of the native seed I used on my land, like the Indian grass and the little blue stem, um, I actually, Connecticut College did a, a, a workshop one day with, uh, in conjunction with a, a Wild Ones group. It's a nonprofit group. And they actually gave us all little uh, containers to go out and collect seed out of their patch as part of the lesson of that day. And I actually, it's, it's funny, all, most of the, uh, the Indian grass that I have native on my land it came from that source. Now, so that's one source that you know I personally was able to get, but you could buy it on the market. It's, uh, there's more and more seed companies. You can buy plugs like uh, there's, a, there's a company down in Woodbury uh, Nursery called the uh, Earth Tones Nursery. They'll sell you the plugs, the miniature, the one inch by one inch already, you know, one year growth of native grasses. So you can plant it in plugs or you plant it in seeds, but you, you want to make sure that they're locally native. Thanks, Peter. Yeah. Um, next question that came in is when should fields be mowed? before March or is there, or when in March? Okay, so um, fields, nesting, prime nesting habitat is from Mar you know, April 1 through August. Now, uh, mowing the field, if you're, if you're gonna uh, mow it yourself, I'll give you an example. We mow um, Goshen WMA and we, we don't have a farmer hang it. So, we mow that, we have half of those fields are mowed, half. Field A, I label field A and field B. And odd years, like even odd years, I have them, I have our staff mow half the field. So um, you mow from um, anytime after December through early March. Now you wanna leave half of it there because there's a lot of insects that are dormant in the vegetation. They'll, they'll, they'll hibernate in the vegetation. And the seeds are eaten throughout the winter by a lot of songbirds. Like you saw the junco eating the seeds off of the deer tongue grass. Um, so you wanna have at least half the field, half of your field available and for rabbits and for bulls and for cover for a lot of animals. So, so the answer when you should mow an area is from uh, December through March. Then, um, if you have a hay field and you have a farmer haying it, if you got, if you sat on a tractor, you could do about five acres a day. And if you have a farmer haying it, um, we have a July 15th first cut date. That may not work for every farmer because they want to get an earlier cut. But if you want to not mow over things, July 15th is our earliest that we allow it on state land except for uh, special circumstances. Sure. Thanks, Peter. Uh, I think there's two more questions in the chat that came in while you're talking. I'll see if anything else has come in as I scroll down. Um, the next question is asking, is there an invasive species that should be a priority to prevent in Connecticut? Okay, um, is there an invasive species to a priority? So there's 97 invasive species and every property can be uniquely uh, populated with these plant, you know, these plants. 
So, you, you know, there's, there's no one answer for every property. You know, you go to one place in like that Housatonic River wildlife management area, Automal, I mean, um, this tree of heaven was predominant and it was just, you know, the, the, they were throwing out seeds and proliferating. So we prioritize that. Um, there is some, um, you know, like Mile a Minute is another one that used, you know, people, uh, it first it came into Connecticut, it was identified and they didn't want it spreading around. So wherever people were on high alert to get it, out, knock it out, if you find it. And, um, you know, it, it works, but it, it doesn't work. It's like, you have to make your decision for your own property, whatever property you're managing, you should prioritize what you can manage on that piece of land uh, by, by amount of, amount of, you know, your effort that you can put in, how much equipment you have, how many people are going to help you, you know, what, what type, what types of invasives do you have, what's available to yourself is, uh, and then how much of it is on the property, you know, that, that you can uh, make a difference. I would always start with the, what they call the lowest hanging fruit, the easier, the easiest one to manage. If there's just one patch of garlic mustard and you can take it out, well, you take it out. If there's only one little patch of Japanese stokegrass, you knock it out. If there's, you know, five or six acres of honeysuckle or winged euonymus, and it's going to be tough. You're going to have to prioritize that when you get, you know, uh, some scouts to help you out or some, uh, you know, some more muscle power. Yep. Um, Peter, I'm just going to add one more thing to that answer. One of something that I've learned working with some of the people in the forest service and uh, the spotted lantern fly, the insect oh, that's yeah. coming in, they have learned that tree of heaven is a required host species for that insect. Um, and so there's like a, an added benefit to reducing tree of heaven populations because the, the spotted lantern fly cannot reproduce if there's no tree of heaven. So um, sometimes you have situations like that that come up as well. Thank you. That's a great uh, example, Chris. Yeah, the spotted lantern fly, if you, if you find one, you know, you know that, that they're looking for the uh, tree of heaven and um, the spotted lantern fly is a very bad invasive insect that's going to affect other things too. So yeah, great, great point, Chris. And uh, we didn't talk, I talked about plants in this lecture. You know, there, there's all, you know, there's also invasive organisms, insects and, um, uh, you know, uh, birds. Uh, so we, you know, that could be a whole other lecture, but oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, great, great example, Chris. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, sure. I just wanted to share it because it's something that's coming out is like emerging right now. So right, right. So I have one more question in the chat box. Um, it's a question about what do you do with the cuttings of the plants after you you've removed them or, or taken them out of the ground? Okay. So if there's no seeds on them, if there's seeds, I like to clip the seeds off and put them in bags, garbage bags, because then the garbage bag gets burned and incinerated. So like I've cut down knotweed patches that are relatively small. We'll cut and take the seeds and put them in bags. Um, but if there are no seeds on the plants, you, uh, you can make brush piles out of them, you know, make, uh, just pile them up, let them decompose, create little uh, cover for rabbits or, or animals. So that's, uh, another. make sure there's no roots attached. If there's roots that touch the ground and then it can re-sprout. That's why I hang a lot of them upside down. But if they're cut vegetation, like the autumn olive branches that were, didn't have roots, we made a big brush pile. If there's roots attached, make sure you air them out. You can lay them out on, on uh, pavement, let them dry out and bake in the sun before you um, compost them. Excellent. Um, there's no more questions that have come in in the chat. Um, so if anybody has anything else, you can put it into the chat box um, and we'll wait just a minute or two. And just remind everybody that there is uh, the aquatics uh, workshop will be tomorrow at 4 p.m. So hopefully we see a lot of you same folks come in for that tomorrow afternoon. Uh, and these are recorded, so um, they will be posted on our uh, CT Envirothon YouTube channel um, after we get the recording out of the uh, out of Zoom here. Oh, another question came in, Peter. Yep. What do you do with the bagged seeds? So the bag, the invasive seeds, you can you you basically put them in the garbage. They're, they're, uh, you know, in a burnable compost, you know, I mean, a burnable um, garbage, you know, uh, you, you get permission from your school or from your own uh, garbage 
if it's a real lot, then you, you might have to bake them in the bags in this hot sun um, before, you know, make sure they're all, some people will burn them. Um, but usually I uh, will do invasive plant management before they go to seed. You know, you want to, you want to do your action before it gets to the seed level, you know, the seed stage. I don't have any other things coming into the chat, but I'll, I'll take the opportunity. To, Peter, thank you for this presentation. It was uh, super informational, a lot of good topics covered. Uh, and I'm sure that um, anybody that had questions about this after the fact it comes up, they could reach out to you directly to follow up or questions with their school properties, anything along those lines. Okay, great. Okay, good seeing everybody. Yep. So thank you, everybody. I think that'll uh, wrap up our workshop. I will uh, stop recording.